If you're just starting out as a magician or looking to grow your magician's business and start to make money as a magician, then this episode of Fix Your Business is definitely for you. Welcome back everybody, it's the next episode of Fix Your Business and I've got an amazing guest on, magician Kerry Scorer, who is going to be talking to us today about how to make money with magic. Well, more to the point, I'm hopefully going to be helping Kerry to make more money with magic. If you do hang on to the end of this video, Kerry has promised us a trick, uh, so I can guarantee it's, it's worthwhile hanging on to the end. We're going to do about half an hour of the interview and then we'll hopefully see some magic at the end of it, Kerry. So welcome to the show, Kerry. Hi, thank you for having me. I have to say, we need to give out awards because your background is the best background I think we've had on the show so far. Let's kick things off with, um, just give us a very quick introduction about how you got into magic and uh, how you kind of started your business. Okay, so, I mean, I grew up um, watching magic. I watched um, Paul Daniels and Debbie McGee, which I guess is probably giving my age away a little bit. And I always wanted to be Debbie, the dresses, the glamour, the glitter but decided to go down the other route instead and, and become a magician. I kind of got into it by accident. I met people who did magic as a hobby. Um, I joined my local magic club, which was when I was living in Hull. And then it just went from there. I heard about this, you know, elusive magic circle and, and things. And I'm proud to say I'm a member now um, and have been for many years. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just basically just come about really just by chance, I guess. I think I've just been very, very fortunate. Awesome. So you've come onto the show because you want to know about sort of, um, well, a couple of things, potentially how you can um, charge a little bit more for the magic, which you're, you're doing. You obviously do a lot of sort of private events, weddings and things like that at the moment. Um, and also how to um, grow your audience. So uh, we're going to dig into that. Now, we talked about some of your goals um, off air, which was one of them was to kind of hit uh, regular sort of monthly revenue somewhere around about the four to five K mark. So talk to us um, very sort of briefly about how you currently charge for the magic which you do. Okay, so I charge, I mean, it all depends on where I'm going, um, how long they want me for, what the event is and things. For weddings, I have a, a, a definite amount because, well, if it's a, a local area, obviously I'm in the Gloucestershire area. So if it's local to me, then I just have a flat fee for around two hours at a wedding. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, that, that works for me. That's um, 350, 350. Um, and I say two hours, but I'm kind of, you know, it, it, it's for the, the time slot. So I'm not rushing and I'm not, you know, I'm not rushing to them. I'm not rushing off um, for them or anything. I arrive in plenty of time. I get ready when it feels, you know, when it feels right, when the people are around. And then I finish when the time slot finishes. So normally I do between the wedding um, ceremony and the wedding breakfast. So once everybody's gone through and then I've had sort of 10 minutes with the bride and groom to show them some things then that's when it finishes if it's two hours it's two hours if it's more it's more you know i'm kind of quite flexible on that i'd rather do the the period of time rather than well it's you know two hours i'm going now sort of thing and i kind of keep that as a as a general price and that seems to work very well um for me um, what I, just out of curiosity what would you say your conversion rate is at the moment quite quite high actually i would i would say um i mean i do a lot of wedding fairs um and obviously you know i mean i do a lot, well, sometimes when you're at wedding fairs people come up and they go oh a magician you know they don't even think you know and and i'd show them some stuff and it's really nice actually when they're the ones that will then ring up and go actually you know we, we want to book you we didn't even know that was a thing so there are people that don't realize you know so i might see people at wedding fairs and they didn't realize a magician was a thing and it's not on their list but people who do come up and say oh we've been looking for a magician um then I'm happy to say that my conversion rate, I would say, yeah, is, is quite high. I would say okay. probably. Put a percentage on it for me. I would say 70 to 80 percent of inquiries for weddings. Okay. Um, that, Why do you think that it's as high as it is? Probably because, um, although I think I get a lot of weddings, I probably don't get masses of them. So I've probably been recommended or they've seen me at a wedding fair or, you know, the, there's something in there. They've looked at my social media that my Instagram page gets quite a lot of attention for weddings and things on there. Um, so I think it's probably that. Also, I think as well, just because I'm a girl, you know, it's, it's just that little bit different. You know, most people, when they say, oh, you know, magicians, I mean, I still get it now. If I, if I go to an event and I say, oh, hi, I'm the magician and they go, oh, <laughs> you're a girl, you know, and it's, 
uh, so it, you know, it still sort of surprises people. So I think some people quite like that as well, just to have that little bit of different, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, and also I like to think because I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which I, I, you know, I don't doubt you are. Most of the business owners we come across, they're, they're brilliant in what they do. Would it surprise you if I said that you're vastly undercharging for your time at the moment? Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> okay. I think you could probably keep a relatively high conversion rate and double, if not maybe even close to treble your pricing without kind of, you know, losing too much work. Okay. So do you want to know how? <laughs> Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen very quickly and then we can actually kind of dig into the numbers because this is really, really, really important. Um, hopefully you can see this okay. So um, some of the people who've watched this before will probably be familiar with um, this diagram which I'm about to do because it is, um, it, it, it is like a basic, very basic sales funnel and the numbers will start to become a bit more um, sort of, they'll make more sense for you. So obviously one of the things we're going to be talking about is how to build um, your audience a bit later on. So we start that off by obviously producing content to kind of warm people up, build up, start to build up that know, like, and trust journey for prospective clients. You're kind of doing that by getting out and doing events. Like when you actually go and do a wedding, you're kind of, that is a piece of content effectively, which you're then putting out to other people who haven't yet booked you. So you're creating that kind of word of mouth referral anyway, um, which is good. And obviously I saw a couple, couple of videos where people have kind of shared like the reaction videos and things like that, which somebody else had obviously taken, not necessarily you. Again, that's some nice content which is getting out there. Um, but the next thing that um, then that starts is something called conversations, which will hopefully lead to a sales consultation. And then you'll convert and you'll get a booking off the back of it. But the numbers of the thing which I want you to pay attention to. So for every 70 conversations you start, you should be booking 10 consultations off the back of it, which will lead to two clients booking okay now that that relationship between those two numbers is um quite important so a good conversion rate for a service-based business is actually somewhere between one in five and one in three now i didn't make any of these numbers up this actually came from a white paper um which google produced called zero moments of truth so they studied a gazillion bits of data smashed it all together and worked out that actually um, it comes from the, the, the age old days of like cold calling. So 70 calls, 10 appointments, two sales. And they actually worked out that the numbers correlated for businesses just like yours, that one in five to one in three conversion rate is about right. Now you actually said you're converting somewhere between 70 and 80%. So when I challenge people on that and say, well, actually your conversion rate's way too high, which means you're far too cheap at the moment. Like you want a bit of tension in the marketplace. You want more people saying no than they're saying yes, because then that means you've reached that point of equilibrium. So if I said to you, Kerry, why don't you go out and, you know, why don't you go and double your prices tomorrow? What would be the first thing that you would think? <laughs> I'd, um, my initial reaction I'd probably, I would probably be that people wouldn't pay that. Yeah, so uh, international sign of distress, nobody would ever pay that. People would think I'm stupid, oh, taking the piss out, it's a wedding, blah, 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 everybody's, money, you know, capitalising on weddings. The truth is, you don't actually know, do you? No. No, because there's a story which you kind of told yourself, which is, oh, people won't pay it. Now, I'm not going to go into necessarily the value system on why that story is happening for you. But what we don't know is whether that story is true or not. So um, how we actually go about sort of validating that story is to go out and pitch it, ten, pitch your product to 10 or 20 you know the next couples that you're going to go and do a wedding for but at 700 pounds as opposed to 350 might seem like a bit of a scary prospect and probably you might need a bit of you know help with your sales training if you make your product better bigger and or more expensive generally speaking you've got to get a little bit more scaled around the sales side of things but i think because you're only pricing yourself at um sort of that 350 pound mark i know for a fact that there are, you know, and you think about people spending tens of thousands of pounds potentially on weddings, mm -hmm. actually 350 pounds is just a drop in the ocean for like the average wedding. I think if you looked at the average um, amount somebody spends on a wedding, it's something like 12 and a half thousand pounds now. So there's bandwidth there for somebody to spend 700 pounds on a magician. And don't forget as well, I, if you, if somebody is spending a bit more money with you, you you can actually kind of start to add in more value if, need, if needs be. So you're saying you're already staying there, well, you can stay there and do even more stuff if necessary, if the, if the money's there and there's no friction. 
So you're not going to get frustrated that kind of, well, they've only paid for two hours. Now I'm going into three hours and it's kind of my hourly rates getting depleted. You're kind of like, well, actually I'm getting paid my worth. So I'll stay for a bit longer, add loads more value. So more money equals more time to deliver a better, val um, better quality product. And so round the circle goes. What we've got to do is you've got to, I think it's one of those things, you might have to make the decision, right, I'm just going to go and test out what Robin's saying for the next 10 people I'll pitch at 750 or 700 quid to see how many I get. Now I can guarantee to you that you will get probably at least one in, one in um, five to one in three. So 25 to 33% conversion rates. You'll still get people saying yes. It might be fewer than 70 to 80%, but it won't be half, I don't think for sure. Um, and but what i can guarantee though is clients are like buses so the, if you pitch to 10 the first it will be the first eight that say no it will be the last two which say yes so you've got to hold your nerve and this is where actually a lot of um small business owners fall down is because they don't have the bottle and the patience to wait for the right opportunities to come along yeah that it's what what i call they're um too busy stepping over the pounds to get to the pennies because they've got to pay for their mortgage today they've got to pay put food on the table today they need money so does any of that kind of resonate so so yes. far, so far so yeah. and and now think about it this way when you're at a gig or at a consultation or you know who is the most important person in that transaction you or the client the client Client, and it should be the client 100%. But if you're approaching sales from a person, I'm not suggesting you are, this is the royal you, this is what I see with a lot of business owners doing. But what I see is a lot of the time when people are making sales, it's all about them for the reasons I've just said. They, they need the money, they need to pay their mortgage, they need, to, and it's like, actually when it's all about me going into a sales situation, it means the client's best interests aren't being looked after. And it, you can see the focus has shifted slightly. Um, again, whereas actually if we're just a bit more patient and we know that when we get the opportunities, we're going to get well compensated for it, the neediness starts to kind of drift away. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go back to the diagram. We'll just finish it off. So we've got the um, 70 10 2. The final, this is called my five C's model, just so people know. You end up with those loyal clients and it's those people who kind of refer people to you. And the more, the more gigs you're doing at a higher price, which generates more loyalty in amongst the clients because they've invested more so that, you know, that you can see how it's all kind of stacking up, the more referrals you're likely to get in as well. Yeah. Um, and because they're coming in pre-warned, you've got a greater opportunity, a greater chance of converting them. And yes, yes. I don't know about you, but probably there are, um, you know, if somebody's going to spend 350, they'll spend 700. Because they're not paying for two hours of your time, they're paying for the experience, which is completely different. Yes. They're paying for like the outcome and the results. And that is often a lot worth a lot more than like what I call the features that go into a product. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I suppose for me, I'd be thinking, well, they're paying 350 for a magician, and there's quite a few magicians around that would obviously do it for that price. But then it's are they yeah. paying for a magician or are they paying for me? Yeah. And that's so, how... so you've got to find a way of kind of um, it's it's what I call articulating your value and you've got to be able to articulate your value better than anybody else. So um, how we do that is actually more about education than anything else. And I'll tell you a, a little story, actually. In fact, I'll reflect back something which you said. So if you said I'll do two hours. It's three fifty, and I might, uh, you know, it happens between here and here. This is kind of what they're going to get. And you'll you'll list off a bit of like close up stuff, bit of card magic, a bit of you know the fe what I call the features. So imagine this scenario, Kerry, and I think you might have heard me tell this story before, but it's useful for this. Um, the AA story, you know, the guy in the AA van, right? So you've gone and done a show, you, you, you live in uh, Gloucestershire, you've gone and done a show up in Hull. It's late on a Saturday night because it was a wedding and it dragged on a bit and it's like two, it's now like 1 a.m., right? Middle of winter, two degrees, pissing down with rain and you're shooting down the M5 to get back to New England, the, whichever the motor, the M50, I think it is, to get across the, you know, the countryside to get there and um, tide blows out, okay? So, so, you phone up the AA guy, eventually he shows up an hour and a half later, so it's now past two, you've been waiting on the side of the road, just soaked through, freezing cold, right? And he goes, Kerry, just before I fix your car, they've just given me a new AA van, let me, let me show you the AA van, it's got these brand spanking new shiny alloy wheels on it, it's got this amazing snap-on toolkit on the bit, back, in the back of it with, you know, this, this whole like tool set that kind of, you know, imperial and metric, it's got this air compressor that'll get your tire off in a jiffy, I can see you, I've got to fix your tire. 
uh, it's, and he's, all he's doing is talking about these features, right? And how amazing his van is. What are you thinking whilst he's telling you that? Just fix my car. <laughs> fix my car, yeah. And, and like now, because I want to get home. I want to see my family. I'm fed up and cold, yeah. right? So what happens is the most, the, and, and again, what, this might be something which you've experienced. So when a client says, how much, that dreaded question, what are you like yeah it's 350 and you say it like really confidently and like or do you kind of like you know shrink down a little bit like Gollum and his ring and just kind of 350 pounds I, I I don't know actually I, I would like to say that I feel confident each time um but yeah probably now and again I don't know maybe not yeah okay. And okay, yeah. so there's a there's a little bit of a like it sounds like on the at a scale of one to ten, you're like a six or a seven on the confidence scale there. So you're kind of up there, but not up up there. Yeah, I think it depends maybe on how the conversation has gone beforehand. Of of you know, so if they say you know we got your number from so and so because we saw, or we saw you at their wedding, then I'm like I'm more confident because they know exactly what I'm going to be doing, so I can then just go in and charge that, and that's how much I am. Um, yeah. So. So, so the confidence thing is quite important because <laughs> again it means that there's this there, if you're not feeling confident there's an emotional attachment to the sale yeah okay and that actually ha impacts your ability to sell so it should be no it's 700 pounds and we say it confidently and you know like it's just normal and it's part it's part of the process and actually when we say it we don't care whether they say yes or no because actually if they say no or whether they say yes or no it's going to be the best result for them so if they say yes this is great go ahead great we're, we're tickety boo if they say no they'll probably have genuine reasons for that now for example if they come back and say oh gosh that's expensive and you've probably had people even say that at 350 how does that make you feel yeah i i, I guess if i was charged if i'm charging 350 i don't go down but no. if i was charging 700 yeah i would be very tempted to discount my price straight away and okay. I, I wouldn't do that at 350 so why should I do it at seven great I'm glad you, you've made that as a great piece of self-awareness actually I like that yeah. but one of one of the things which I've noticed a lot is when people are challenged on price especially through it because it's being expensive all of a sudden we go oh but I've but I, I've got my, my, my shiny tools are amazing and my air compressor is yeah. the best that it can. So we start like having to justify ourselves by talking about features. Yeah. And actually a, a better way to, when we get challenged on price, the, the, generally speaking, the objection is never about price. The objection is actually around their confidence and your ability to deliver and the fact that they're going to get good value for money. Yeah. Okay, which is slightly different. So what I mean by that is, uh, or one of the best ways to come back to when somebody says, oh, it's expensive. First question you should always ask is, well, why do you say that? Because you've got to understand like what, what it is that, you know, they might say, oh, we've spoken to three other magicians and they're all 300 quid. So we're like, we don't understand why you're double. And you can just say, well, I'm better than them. <laughs> okay. And, and you can also say, well, one of the things which they won't offer is a money back guarantee. So if I come in, I am better than them. I'm more expensive than them. And I know that, but if I come in and you feel you don't get value for money on the day, I'll just hit the refund key because it is not worth my reputation. Like, you know, not delivering remarkable value and, and giving your guests the best experience they're ever going to get. So can you see the difference in how you articulate that value compared to taking justification and taking people to the back of the AA van, which sounds a bit dodgy, but um, <laughs> versus having confidence in your ability to deliver which is backed up by a cast iron money back guarantee. If you don't feel that you get value for money on the day or there is a problem, I just hit the refund key and I've got no problem with doing that. I've never had to do it yet. I don't think I'll have to do it with you either. Yeah. So you can see the difference in, in the sales pitch all of a sudden. Yeah. Makes sense. So that's why I think that you can easily, if, if you just learn to uh, sell using a couple of kind of um, simple techniques based around confidence, and don't forget magic is all about confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah. to take some element of that in terms of what you're doing with the, the magic in your sales process and I bet you could probably I bet you could close I don't say this about many people but I bet you could close as many people at 700 as you're currently closing at 350 okay so if we got you the same number of bookings in 2021 that you got in 2019 you you're going to double your turnover easily yeah? yeah and it is it is a matter of just having the confidence to uh, it's a three-step process, actually. So I'm going to share my screen again just so I can explain it. So it's it's a three-step process. It's called MVT. So which stands for Mindset, Validation, 
and time. So the idea being that we've just sown the seed of an idea with you that you could charge more. Okay, so we're going to charge more and we're going to charge minimum 700. Now, as you get more confident, so what I tend to see is I go through this process with people and they get more confidence and we get, I get them to a point whereby like they'll charge, you know, tomorrow you're charging 700. That's it. We're done. In a month's time, you'll come back to me and go, Robin, do you know what? Actually, I was, I was with a couple. I, was, I wasn't sure about them, but I felt confident. So actually I pitched it at 900 and you never guess what they said. Yes. So clients actually, once they get this methodology, they start taking it upon themselves and they start increasing the prices themselves. Um, I had somebody, uh, she was a dog trainer or dog behaviorist who was charging 50 pounds for a consultation, which is way too cheap. The initial MVT part um, took a while, but we got it to 150. She came back to me six months later recently and said, I've just charged somebody 850 pounds for a consultation. So, so for one client, she used to have to deliver one consultation. She used to have to deliver like close to 20 consultations before. Yeah. So you can see like the compression time. So we've, we've, we're going to accept 700 pounds. Yep. I'm down with that. Carries in thumbs up, carries in 700 pounds. Great. So the next thing we've got to go out and validate. So the validation process typically takes um, about four to six weeks, which is where the time element comes into it. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but we're going to pitch this to 20, 10 to 20 prospective clients. Okay. Remember, good conversion rate is one in five to one in three. So that's the benchmark that we're going to be testing again, valid, testing against, validating against. So if you come back to me and tell me that you close somewhere between two and six of those prospects we've just validated we know that there is a market out there that's willing to spend 700 pounds to have the amazing kerry come down and deliver some magic at their event um and we've got that nice fine balance between kerry getting well compensated for the work she's doing we've got demand there'll be good cash flow coming into the business because now we're making double per client that we're doing so we can we can actually have not even it's not even half the clients you could actually have probably a third of the clients and still make as much profit as you're currently making Okay. Okay. So you can have dramatically fewer clients, but make a lot more money. It's nothing to say that over time, we don't actually scratch 700 altogether and actually put together a package for you, which is maybe 1500 pounds or maybe two and a half grand. It's like the all you can eat, like most amazing mad wedding magic show on this planet. Okay. There is a market out there for business like that. So now all of a sudden you've got like for you know a quarter of the clients four times the revenue you know yeah. you're laughing yeah. um one of the things which i found actually uh, which is quite interesting is like pe people in service businesses struggle to package up what they're doing so you think about it this way if you've got your 350 pounds product um i don't know if you, do you have more expensive packages which you which you sell at the moment no, not really. I mean, I, if, it depends on travel, basically. So if you wanted me, you know, further afield, then obviously I charge more, but that's because of, of travel, really. So, yeah, but yeah. my price pretty much stays the same. But, you know, obviously, if you wanted me in London, I'd be charging more than 350 because it's, a, you know, it's like a 12 hour round trip. <laughs> you know, so it, it could be, you know, it might be that, um, you know, you, you have the, the basic package, which is now 700. You maybe maybe then you have like a, a, a gold standard package, which it's not just Kerry. Maybe it's Kerry and Richard come as a package that so you can both be moving around and that's that's 1500 quid but then you have your platinum all you can eat which is like some fantastic stage show produced like you know i don't know just some we'll find, there could be something in that but at the moment because you've only got one offer like and you're not putting out those off, other offers we don't know if there's a market for it we don't know if that if you're missing opportunities as a result of it so one of the reasons service business owners struggle is because they're just not putting offers out there they're not mm. testing stuff so you use a similar when you come up with a new product and that's something you and I could probably talk about maybe offline when you start to come up with a new product um, you know you go through a similar sort of process of validation it's just that what we do is we kind of throw out the seed of an idea that we've got this new product coming up would anybody in be interested and then you get to a point where so I there's a book behind me by an author called Daniel Priestley but he's got another book called oversubscribed um, you get to a point whereby if there's enough demand, well, let's build this thing and launch it. Yeah. So that's also validation. But yes. what we want is we want you to come back with two to six people who said yes at a higher price point, gives you the confidence in the process that this is working. Now the bit which everybody finds hard 
is this final part here where we've got to essentially wait four to six weeks for the right opportunities to come along for us to put the offers out and for those offers to be accepted and for the money to hit our bank account. And I'll be honest, most entrepreneurs, because we're excitable like human beings, these amazing ideas, we just want to get on and do it like right now, we don't have the patience to, to, to wait for those opportunities to come along. We don't have the patience to wait for the money to drop into our account. We're like, and so what we end up doing is kind of rushing the sales process. Okay, so if I go back to this, you notice there is a process here to take people through from your content you're putting out to your conversations, to your consultation and getting them into as a client. Okay. This process takes four to six weeks per client. It's just that what's happening is because you've now got a long established business, like people are already part way through that funnel. It's just, you're not measuring exactly where they are through that funnel and you've got this constant flow of opportunities, but now we're just going to start to improve each of the stages. And actually most people focus on the sales, getting the money in now, um, I don't know if you if you have a way, but you need to start measuring the number of consultations you're doing each month with prospects. You need to start finding a way to measure the engagement you're getting on your posts as you put them out and things like that. And I'm going I'm to talk very briefly about engagement and audience building in a second. But yeah, it just takes a bit of time in order to kind of go through that process. And like I said, it will always be the last two out of the first 10 that say yes. So you kind of got to go through and get those no's in order to start getting the yeses and build your confidence yeah. up. Okay. Now, I did also mention I was going to talk about audience building. Is that, has that all made sense? Have you got any questions? For yeah, me? no, definitely. No, no, it's great. So I was doing a little bit of research before um, we came on uh, uh, just now, and I was looking at kind of your online presence and how we can actually start to boost the, I guess, your audience. Because at the moment, like we are in the midst of, a, you know, the biggest sort of global crisis I think we've been in in our, in our generation, potentially since, you know, the Second World War. For some business owners, we were talking about like life has got a bit easier um, uh, business wise. For some people, it's got a bit harder. But one of the things I've been p consistently telling people throughout this crisis is you need to double down on building your audiences. And I think there's a couple of things which you could be doing, which you're not currently doing which could start to kind of grow your Instagram following, potentially YouTube channel, get your Facebook fans like up um, very, very quickly, or not very quickly, but um, so that you can start to build some assets. So one of the things which I've noticed, and Kerry, can I be honest with you? <laughs> of course. One of the things which I've noticed is that your um, content is kind of a lot, it's very personal. It's a lot of stuff that you're kind of interested in. It's a little bit too much about Kerry. It's, right. and, it, and it's a bit like, um, look at what I'm doing. It's like, it's like, it's nothing wrong with it, but it's, it's like, it's very newsworthy. It's like, look at what I've done. Not what I can, not, not at what I can do. Right. And the thing which people will be most interested in, in with you is your ability to do magic. It's what you can do and what you could do at their potential event. So what I, what I was looking at was a lot of like your competition. I, I know this guy's like, you know, um, he's obviously doubled down on, I don't know if you know Chris Ramsey. Yeah. So he's doubled down on his YouTube channel. He's got like 3.96 million subscribers. And there's a few techniques which he's done, you know, in order to start to build that, um, build that audience up. And he's done the same for Facebook and things like that. But um, I found that Instagram is actually like one of the things right now, which is giving us the, as an, as a kind of like a coach, the biggest clues as to what, um, an expert is doing or not doing in their business. So I looked at um, yours, for example, and you've got, you've got some nice videos here, but I think actually you need to be using IGTV more so to actually say, here's a trick, watch this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. same for Facebook, same for YouTube. It's like, you know, get, get, get a camera set up over the shoulder or in front or wherever, you know, maybe two or three cameras and actually just like go through your repertoire of tricks you could even show people some basic like techniques around things like coin magic, how to make simple ways to make coins disappear. Cause people love the tricks, but they're also intrigued as to how they work. And so long as you're not obviously giving away tricks to the trade, these picks and things which are really common, like, like the coin trick up the sleeve. Like we all know that one. I, sh I wow my daughters with that one, right? But actually showing people how to kind of like master some really basic magic um, will generate a great fan base for you. And then they'll book you to come and do their, their sort of amazing event. So you could, you could use Instagram, you, you could do one video, which goes onto IGTV, 
goes onto your Facebook page and a group if you've got one. It goes onto YouTube, it can go onto Twitter, it can go to loads of different places. Um, the reason why I, I've picked on IGTV is because um, it, it is a growing media. And also, I don't know if you knew, but there's a, um, I'm not going to be able to find it now because there's so much stuff from Facebook, but uh, let me just go back to my. So you see down here, you've got these options in this left hand menu for things like live videos. And actually, if you go into the app, there's a video little button in the app, which you click and then you get a stream of like all of the people's pages you like who are doing videos. And I follow some magicians on there and they get like tens, if not hundreds of thousands of views on their videos. If you get into the, the Facebook's video feed. OK, so we want to get into the video feed. We want to get into uh, the IGTV feed. And you've got I mean, you've got uh, so you've got 200 plays. I, I think you could get thousands of plays if you play if you do this correctly um, and then obviously repurpose it into some YouTube stuff now obviously like another thing as well which um, Chris is doing quite um, a lot of is um, there's the magic trick side of it but also puzzles like that whole thing about like um, magic tricks and puzzle solving there's something quite like there's a, there's a link between the two of them so again, like if there's other stuff, like Chris obviously loves puzzles, but if there's other stuff magic based, which you can start to bring in as a theme into your content, I think it would be massively engaging for your, for your fans too. And it's like, it takes time to do videos, like set yourself a re realistic goal, do one a week or one a month to start off with. Yeah. Set up a, a workflow or a process and start rolling them out. There's a yoga instructor there who, um, she, she also does something called a carousel post whereby she'll take her IGTV 10 minute video, chunk it down into 10 one minute videos. Because most people use Instagram, they'll just like put one, in, one photo up there with a bit of text. But actually you can put 10 photos or videos up in a carousel post. So take a 10 minute video, slice it up, and then put little snippets in. Like, especially if you're doing explainer videos on little magic tricks that you want to teach people to do from home. And again, I bet you'd get a ton of engagement if you did some, explored some different things like that. But you, you need to be doing more video yeah you know um flood your facebook page with video with reactions with and like get you in i noticed your reaction ones for example you don't do the build up with the trick you just do the reaction i actually think you need to have an element of like the trick and then and then then you could do like you know because you will have done the trick and like so many times and probably have tons of different reaction videos cut in like five different reactions to the same trick yeah you know so it, it just, it, it takes time. And so you may need to get somebody to kind of help you with um, sort of building out a workflow, help you with taking the videos. Like, and, and especially like if you're getting paid 700 quid, 1500 quid a gig, pay a student to come down with like a Sony mirrorless DSLR and like take some video of you, like high, high res video, which you can start to use. And even if you're just collecting all of the footage, it's there then. You know, you can get it edited further down the line. It doesn't have to cost the earth, but you've got the asset. And yeah. it's asset. I think you get the picture. It's assets, which are the main thing. At the moment, you're, and I think this is the, this, this bit will probably hit home for you. At, at the moment, your marketing is what I call cranking the handle. It's like, I have to be posting on social media all the time, and it's very outbound. And if I stop posting, I tend not to get the, the interaction, and then I don't get the bookings. Whereas actually, if you build marketing assets, things that you invest in and build once really well, like a YouTube channel, like an IGTV channel, like the, um, the magic videos in the newsfeed on Facebook, you invest in the asset once and then it, it's, it's just there, just working for you the whole time. Like I, I have YouTube videos and it's, there's a bit of a, well, it's, it's a not so humble brag. I have terrible YouTube. I'm so embarrassed by the first 40 YouTube videos I did because of what I was wearing in the state, how we staged the setup and stuff like that. But the, the key thing is the content was good. I still get comments from people and even clients from people who saw videos, which I produced four years ago that I think are rubbish. So I'm sweating those assets like all the time, like my books, for example, I went through the pain of like writing a couple of books once or twice, um, get them out there onto Amazon. And I kid you not, I send out a hundred books. I get a client. It's like clockwork. So I'm not having to crank that handle all the time, you know, because yeah. I've got all these assets out there. And I think you need to get to that place. So obviously more than we can cover necessarily on one episode of Fix Your Business. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, the video thing, definitely. And I kind of, I think I've always known that. Um, I used to predominantly do quite a lot of corporate stuff and I can't take video at um, corporate events. But obviously weddings and things, you know, I can. And, and people are also taking 
um, videos and things and stuff. So I do have a lot of footage. Can I challenge you on that? I can't take footage at? At the corporates. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I'm, I'm not allowed, it's in my contract. It's in a, it's in with a, every I, single corporate you go and work with? Um, pretty much, because usually they're through agencies. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I it's, mean, the ag it's the agency issue then, rather than the corporate issue? Um, yeah, but actually, do you know what? I've never, that's made me think now, because I've never, I've just assumed that that's come from the client, you see. So yeah, now I, I'm not sure. Um, get, the guest, get the guest to, um, to film it, to say, yeah. hey, hey, I'm going to do some tricks. Yeah, yeah, get, get your phone out. Hey, why don't you hop onto live stream and just film this and then tag me in afterwards. Here's my card. Like yeah. there's simple ways that you can kind of get around this stuff, but don't um, ever be fooled by the I, I can't word. It's fixed mindset. We've got to get you to a, a, a point whereby you're like, how can I? Because yeah. like life is too short. You've got, to, you, when it comes to like um, marketing, you've got to aggressively grow your profile. It can't be done passively. Um, yeah. so, so find ways around it. Um, little, that's a nice message to kind of finish up with. <laughs> right, we've, we've run over time, Kerry, so uh, it's entirely up to you. You can say, no, I don't want to do this, but I did ask you at the start if we could have a trick. Here we go. Oh, pot noodle, lunchtime. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> um, and I just want to point out as well to anybody watching this, when I, I am at your wedding or corporate event or anything like this, um, my hair will be better than this. <laughs> <laughs> I have mine, lockdown mine too. <laughs> I have locked down hair, but I'm in at 9 a.m. on Saturday to have it done. So next week I'll be back to being blonde, <laughs> hopefully. Anyway, so I just wanted to put that out there in case they're going to charge you 700 pounds. And have you seen her two-tone hair? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I have got my pot noodle pots, in, um, but inside I've got. Hopefully you can see that they're all mixed up. Yep. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to split these roughly. Um, Let's go roughly about, let's go about halfway, shall we? Um, hang on. Let me just give them a shuffle. All right. So I'll just give them an, oh, a cut to about halfway. And I'm going to pop them back in my pot. It's because I'm doing it sat down and I'm normally stood up. I'm not used to <laughs> sat down. It's really weird how things can throw you out. I'm just going to pop the lid on and I'm going to give them a shake up. What's going to happen now is all of the face up cards are going to mingle in with the face down cards and the face down cards are going to mingle in with the face up cards. So hopefully we should have a little bit of a mess. So we've now got face up, face down, face up, face down cards. Hopefully yep. you can see that in there. I'll just go right through just to show you that it goes right through to the end as well. Uh, hopefully you can see that in there. Yep. All right. So I'm going to pop these back in. Pop the lid back on. Now I'm going to give them a shake. Robin, I want you to choose whether you want a black card or a red card. Uh, I'm going to go for a black card. You're going to go for a black card? Yeah. Would you like a spade or a club? A uh, spade, please. And which spade would you like? Number four. No, number four? Yeah. So four of spades. Four of spades. <laughs> Now what's happening is all of the cards are now turning around and facing the same way, all except for one. And if I have a little look now inside, we should find that they are now all back facing the same way, all except for this one here. <gasps> no, don't tell me that's the four of spades. <gasps> no way! <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Kerry. Oh, you've made my day. I'm going to be worried now, thinking about like all day long. How did Kerry do that? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, thanks so much for that, Kerry. Listen, um, I also want to say thank you for being uh, a guest on Fix Your Business as well, because uh, it can be quite a scary prospect for some people. And you said, please don't make me cry at the start. So I don't think we, we managed to um, avoid that. Uh, listen, if you are watching this and you want to be a guest on Fix Your Business and have a bit of live coaching, um, one, you've got to be able to do a magic trick from now on. I'm not going to let anybody else on unless I can do a magic trick. Uh, two, just drop me a quick email, robin at fearless.biz, with a bit of a background about your business, um, and we'll see if you're a good fit for the, um, for the channel. And please do make sure that you, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, we're going to be trying to do one sort of weekly, so do hit the subscribe button and the little bell notification um, below this video so that you can see some future Fix Your Business episodes. Kerry, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you got some value out of that. Thank you so much. 
I did, and thank you. And if anybody is watching this and they're thinking, oh, I don't know whether I should go on, do it. Robin has been amazing. He's asked me loads of questions. He's really opened my eyes. And because now you have to learn a magic trick, then um, let me know. I can teach you some. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, there we go. Love it. Self-teach. Awesome. <laughs> I'm down with that. I agree with that.